Chances are, if you clicked on this video, you probably already have some idea about the ongoing chip crisis that's affecting everyone's ability to get their hands on the latest and greatest GPUs. It's something we all hoped would be a brief issue around the launch of the first RTX 3000 series and RX 6000 series cards, much like a typical spike in demand for a new product. And yet, here we are, nine months later, with, at least at the time of filming, no obvious end in sight, and news stories keep coming out consistently, showing more impacts beyond the PC gaming world. No matter what retailers, manufacturers, and famous tech YouTubers do, the majority of gamers can't get their hands on a new GPU at MSRP. This leads to uh, either settling for expensive second-hand cards, or succumbing to the ludicrous scalper prices for new cards, or just having to hope, pray, and wait. So today, I want to dive deeper into some of the finer details of this dire situation, and try and provide the best estimates for when normality may resume, at least in the GPU world. Unfortunately, what we have today, and right now, is far from normal. GPUs are usually a depreciating asset. You buy it and it immediately loses value. But that just isn't the case right now. Take last gen's RTX 2060 6 gig, which launched around two and a half years ago in January 2019 for an MSRP of £270. If you want to get your hands on one of those today, you'll need about 470 or £200 more. How about a GTX 1066 gig, a now nearly five year old card which launched in July 2016 at an MSRP of 239. Second hand price today does vary a little, but try roughly 289 or 50 pounds more expensive than when it was brand new. The used market for an RTX 3060, well, you'll struggle to find one, but if you did buy one at MSRP of 300 pounds and then used it, well, the good news is that you could make your money back and actually double it, selling it for around 600 or more. If you haven't managed to get your hands on one of these cards for MSRP, I'm not surprised and you're definitely in the majority. These kinds of rather shocking examples are just the start though. And as I alluded to earlier, GPUs are not alone in being affected. The automotive industry has been another high profile victim with widely reported issues relating to the low supply of chips, which has led to some serious knock-on impacts for manufacturers. Audi, for one, has made 10,000 fewer cars in Q1 of 2021 and had to furlough 10,000 workers, all as a result of not having sufficient chips to use in their new vehicles. Ford, on the other hand, had to cancel shifts at two of its car plants, with their predictions indicating a potential $2.5 billion hit to their profits this year, and that's after posting a $1.2 billion net loss last year. In perhaps the worst case I've found yet, General Motors has had to outright stop production of the Chevrolet Camaro and two models of Cadillac, diverting supply of what chips it has to its higher volume models. Oh, and they closed an entire car plant too. The chip shortage as a whole has uh, been estimated to cost the automotive industry $110 billion. That's 80% higher than the original prediction that was made in January this year, indicating that this problem has only gotten worse over the course of 2021. Luckily for many of us, the used car market is still relatively plentiful, although there is some anecdotal evidence that prices for used cars are creeping up as more buyers opt to buy older cars than newer ones. And as one final honorable mention for a non-GPU victim, we have the next gen of consoles. Many parents would have hoped that the console shortage at Christmas was the usual hyper over a, a new and shiny thing, which would die down before their kid's next birthday rolled around. But, as you might have guessed, it's basically as hard to buy a new console as it is to buy a new GPU, which, after everything you've heard so far, shouldn't be too surprising. 
And with that, PC gamers and console gamers have finally been united by a common enemy. But who or what should we actually be sharpening our pitchforks for? Well, here's where it all gets complicated, as there's not one easy culprit to pin down for this chip shortage. First off, we have the global elephant in the room, the pandemic. Covid hit the world like a freight train, disrupting supply chains as factories were forced to close due to lockdowns, employees off sick with Covid or quarantining, and incredibly volatile demand spikes. China was the first region to be impacted heavily by the virus, forcing businesses to halt production while everyone quarantined. The trouble is, China manufactures around 30% of the entire world's products. So no output from them means not only no stock of end user products, but also knock on effects where companies that do build products can't get the components they need to do so. The other obvious cause, at least for us gamers, is crypto mining. A perfect storm of new hardware and surging values of the main coins means profitability skyrocketed. Everyone and their dog heard about Bitcoin back in 2018 with the last price surge, so anyone with even slight technical knowledge used this spike as an entry point and started mining, often on an entire industrial scale. An example of that is the story from Birmingham of a Bitcoin mining farm that was raided by the police because they thought it was a cannabis farm but turned out to be 100 ASICs mining away on stolen electricity ran by three nerds. Lastly, the problem with purchasing products that we're all painfully aware of, bots and scalpers. Writing a bot to buy up stock the very instant it becomes available isn't overly hard these days, so unscrupulous scalpers looking to make easy money or crypto miners looking to score the next batch of cards are using bots to snap up all of the stock in milliseconds. These scalpers are also helping to restrict supply, creating artificial scarcity, driving legitimate sellers' automatic pricing models to skyrocket. Then the vicious cycle takes over as scalpers can then increase prices even more, and well, you know the rest. What you might not know though are some of the more obscure factors beneath the surface which not everyone talks about when discussing the situation. A less obvious cause, not only of the GPU shortage, but the whole global chip crisis, is the unprecedented demand for those chips. Everything these days, from your phone to your fridge, needs microcontrollers, NAND flash, and SOCs. Cars in particular use a lot of lower spec chips for the hundreds of modules in each vehicle and are now using even more powerful CPU plus GPU units to run their digital dashboards and infotainment displays. The number of silicon dyes needed for all of these new pieces of tech is growing massively year on year at a rate faster, at least seemingly, than chip fabs can keep up with. On top of that, COVID caused a gooseneck in demand on top of the natural increasing growth. At the start of the pandemic, companies' predictions were that COVID would significantly reduce demand, so many cut down their orders of everything from raw materials to those chips. However, their predictions turned out to be wrong, and demand increased significantly as many people found themselves with more disposable income for material goods, given their usual foreign holidays and leisure venues were no longer available. Inevitably, this included needing, you guessed it, more chips, such as cars, big TVs, and shiny new gaming computers. All of the manufacturers that had cut their orders with fabs like TSMC then found themselves at the back of the queue trying to increase their supply to meet demand. Some firms were more savvy and delayed product launches long enough to accrue plenty of stock to fill demand, like Apple, who slightly delayed the launch of the iPhone 12, ensuring bountiful stock even at launch. That increased demand had a knock-on effect of longer lead times between orders and fulfillment across the board. The, these increased steadily over 2020 as demand naturally rose and production capacity didn't, but it skyrocketed at the start of 2021. The average lead time in January for a microcontroller was around 16 weeks. 
but by April, it was 44. That's nearly a year, making annual product cycles basically impossible. Bottlenecks in the supply chain can also extend those wait times. For example, SML Holding NV, who brand themselves as the world supplier to the semiconductor industry, hold a virtual monopoly on the cutting edge photolithography equipment needed to manufacture modern small process node designs. Another example is Shin Etsu Chemical Company, who supply the majority of chemicals used in semiconductor manufacturing. So if either of these firms have delays, there is a massive chain reaction slowing the entire world down. To top it all off, the largest chip fabrication company in the world, Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC as it's more commonly known, is facing the worst drought the nation has seen in 56 years. TSMC uses 156,000 tonnes of water per day, and the Taiwanese government has asked them to reduce their usage by as much as 15%, compounding the shortage issues for obvious reasons. Even if you can uh, build your own products without any bottlenecks, there is a good chance you won't be able to ship them anywhere once they're made. As demand for physical goods increased, space on cargo ships has vanished. This is also partially due to medical equipment taking priority, and thanks to the sharp decline in passenger air transport, air freight capacity has plummeted too, as much of the space on a, in a passenger plane's hold is sold as cargo space. But less passenger planes flying means less capacity. And again, what capacity there is, is often utilised for life-saving medical equipment anyway, so good luck getting affordable transit to get your products into consumers' hands. The Suez Canal blockage also didn't help, causing billions of dollars worth of goods to be delayed for weeks or months as the ships had to go the long way around Africa or wait for the blockage to be cleared. And on top of all of that, there's also a shortage of shipping containers. Containers aren't being loaded back onto ships that are headed back to Asia, instead they're piling up in already congested ports. A UK firm quoted six to eight week delays just for the shipping containers. All of these issues slow things down, but the real nail in the coffin for manufacturing is a technique called just-in-time production. This was first pioneered by Toyota, and it works like this. The factory that makes the rubber for the tyres should only ship a batch to Michelin when the wheels have been made and are ready to have tyres fitted to them. But those wheels should only be made when the rest of the car is ready to be assembled, which itself should only be built when the dealers are ready to have more cars on site. Each step in the process runs just in time hence the name, so all of the components you need should arrive exactly when they're needed, as holding stock costs money and slows your ability to pivot to market demand. The trouble here is that most companies do it wrong, without much extra thought. Toyota saw its reliance on chips and held between three and six months inventory, knowing that they'd still be useful no matter what happened, which is the reason they are the only automaker that haven't seen much impact from the chip shortage. They haven't had to shut plants or cut production, unlike most other automakers. Everyone else held no stockpiles, meaning they were fully at the whim of their suppliers as I touched on earlier. On top of that, there are so few chip fabs in the world, and even fewer that can produce the bleeding edge process nodes that modern tech like GPUs require. TSMC is the main source, with your only other option being Samsung if you want a seven nanometer chip. If you want five nanometer, again, your only options are TSMC or Samsung. Even for larger process notes, SMIC, UMC, and Global Foundries are your main choices, but by market share, TSMC controls 54% of the foundry market. TSMC's main customers are Apple with 25% share, AMD with 9%, MediaTek and Broadcom with 8%, Intel and Qualcomm with around 7%, and Nvidia with around 6 
If you aren't one of those brands though, or you're buying from them, you're gonna have a rough time getting your chips built. In my best attempt to channel my inner Tech Tech potato, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the production capacity of TSMC and Samsung, which for the seven nanometer node Nvidia is using from Samsung for these new cards, it's about 40,000 wafers per month. Taking a look at an image of both an RTX 3080 and an RTX 3070 die using the GDR, GDDR6 package as a measurement, which are 14 millimeters by 12 millimeters, we can measure the pixels of that package and then measure the die so that we can get the X and Y dimensions. For an RTX 3080, a GA102 die, a rough estimate puts it at around 27 millimeters by 23.5. That net's roughly the same die size quoted, only a few millimeters square off. For an RTX 3070, the, the same process applies, and that offers you a die size of around 20 millimeters by 19.5. If you plug those numbers into the Kali Technologies die per wafer calculator with a 300 millimeter wafer and a defect density of 0.09, you'll see that including the defect dies, you can get a maximum of 79 GA102 dies per wafer and 137 GA104 dies. I've included the defect dies here as the benefit of using the same die for different SKUs is that you can absorb those defects and just sell it as a lower end model with some cores disabled. Of course, some will be fully broken, but many can be tiered down. That's the first piece of data. The second is how many were made. Using the Steam hardware survey, RTX 3080s account for 0.9% of GPUs using Steam, with uh, RTX 3070s accounting for 1.48. Rough napkin math says that there are likely 500,000 to a million RTX 3070s produced versus 250 to 750,000 RTX 3080s. Now, putting those two data points together, Best case where you can get the maximum number of useful dies out of a wafer and that they sold the fewer number of cards, Nvidia would have bought around 3,650 wafers from Samsung just for the 3070. Worst case where they weren't able to use the defect dies and they sold the maximum amount, try 10,000 wafers. For the 3080, best case is 3,200, worst case is 16,000. Taking a look at Samsung's 7 nanometer capacity again, even with the lower estimates, that would take around 15% of Samsung's monthly capacity just for these two cards. In reality, it's some, probably somewhere in the middle of my estimates, meaning an even larger share. Now, of course, these cards weren't all built in the month. They'll have been built over 6 to 12 months in advance of the launch, but therein lies the issue. Lead times at TSMC are reported to be between 6 and 12 months for these sorts of chips right now, and assuming this, the same could be said for Samsung, Nvidia won't be able to dramatically increase supply anytime soon. They also don't want to overcorrect, creating far too much stock for the market, so they're likely hedging their bets with steady increases in supply for the next few months, rather than trying to go all out and double the number of units produced in a short space of time. And specifically for Nvidia, they outright said that they didn't build enough cards on launch. Quote, the demand for the GeForce RTX 3080 was truly unprecedented. We and our partners underestimated it. So few people bought the first generation RTX cards that Nvidia under forecasted demand and manufactured far too few dies, meaning board partners couldn't build enough cards. It was even claimed they rushed the launch, so much so that their AIBs didn't have enough time to fully test their designs, so issues like the crash to desktop crept in, caused by incorrect capacitors, something their testing would, and eventually did, catch and correct. So, what does the future hold? Well, according to Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, the shortage is likely to take a couple of years to resolve itself, mostly through foundry capacity increases. Intel themselves are building a new fab in Arizona and will be offering their services to others, much like Samsung already does. TSMC is looking to increase its production capacity too, investing $100 billion to increase their output over the next three years. 
that kind of investment, coupled with a slowly saturated market, should allow supply to increase and help decrease demand too. Unfortunately for us though, it's all a waiting game. Thanks to the longer lead times, there is literally a shortage of machines that build other machines that make the products. So even to get a small increase in capacity or production capacity is still incredibly difficult. With all that in mind, where does that leave the humble PC gamer in 2021? Well, right this second, if you want a new GPU, buy a pre-built PC. I've got an affiliate link to Overclockers UK in the description, and they list which items in their builds are in stock, and they have GPUs available. Of course, there are plenty of other SIs you can choose from too, but it, that's your best bet to get a new GPU right now. If you can wait a little, stock levels do seem to be slowly returning. Scan currently lists 112 pre-orders outstanding for various models of the RTX 3080, which is down from the 1000 plus at launch. So in theory, getting in a queue, you might net you a card eventually. Hopefully companies like AMD and Nvidia have learned a difficult lesson from this experience. It was a perfect storm of knock-on events, but at least there's now a chance that they'll be more prepared in the future once the current issues are actually resolved. So there you have a look at the, the GPU crisis, the global chip shortage, and some of the potentially less talked about reasons why it's happening. If you like this video, I would love to hear what you like about it in the comments down below. It's a bit of a new style, uh, and I also want to thank Phil who wrote a lot of this video for me as well. Uh, also, I would love to hear your thoughts on the whole crisis in general, both the, the GPU side, the general tech side, but also from the automotive industry, the consoles, and the whole global chip crisis. If you have any thoughts, if I've missed anything, or just you know your own opinions, feel free to let me know in the comments down below. If you want to help fund and support these videos, specifically this style, then feel free to check out the links in the description. There should also be a YouTube join button popping up very shortly for access to uh, sponsor-free videos and access to our Money Mid Discord chats. And there's a load of other links if you'd prefer to support on Patreon instead, you can still get access to our Money Mid Discord chat there. And there's a load of other affiliate links in the description you can check out from Overclock UK if you're buying from them, Amazon if you're buying from that instead, and even stuff like VPN options, uh, Hubble Bundle, Streamlabs, OBS, there's a load of stuff, feel free to check them out. Oh, and of course, merch show these are t-shirts like this one. This is from my car channel at the wheel that will be linked on the end cards. But there's also some tech ones like an RTX 2060 I designed in Blender. This is a sort of deconstructed view, so feel free to check those out. Otherwise, that is pretty much it. Do feel free to check out more videos on the end cards. Of course, subscribe if you haven't already. If you want to see more videos like this one, again, let me know in the comments. And we will see you all in the next video.